This morning's launch of Discovery is being hailed as the first step in a new era of space cooperation. CNN's John Zarella has more on this historic mission. Historians may one day note that the flight of Discovery changed the course of space exploration. One of the six crew members on board is Russian cosmonaut Sergei Krikalev, the first cosmonaut launched on a U.S. spacecraft. Krikalev is making history, although he doesn't see it that way. I'm not too old to, to be part of history. Such modesty for a man already awarded the title Hero of Russia and Order of Lenin. Although it's hard to detect excitement in the reserved 35-year-old cosmonaut, NASA and the Russian Space Agency see this as a breakthrough. It really marks the beginning of the new level of cooperation between Russia and the United States. Over the next four years, we're going to have several U.S. astronauts flying aboard Russia's near space station. All leading to one major cooperative goal the construction of an international space station with the Russians in the partnership. Krikalev would be right at home there. He spent 15 months aboard the Mir space station. He was orbiting the Earth when the Soviet Union fell. Only one other human, a fellow cosmonaut, has logged more time off the planet. The shuttle flight amounts to little more than a walk in the park for Krikalev, but required more than a year of intense training. We have to study a lot of systems, we have to study language, and all of this came at the same time, and the period of time was very short. Chelsea, something better? Bathtub. Bathtub. Mm -hmm. There were hours of tutored language lessons, rigorous days in the shuttle simulator, <laughs> and training for water survival in case the shuttle ditches in the Atlantic. During the flight, Krikalev will handle the shuttle's grappling arm. Overall, his presence is symbolic, but may well lead to a real celestial partnership between the United States and Russia. John Zarella, CNN, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. In the former Soviet Union in Florida, Space Shuttle Discovery blasted off the launch pad and blasted away from four decades of the Cold War. CBS News correspondent Scott Pelley has that story. Liftoff of Discovery on a boat. Discovery rose at the dawn of a day that many will remember as the end of the space race. The shuttle took off, launching a new, a new age for the world. New because of Sergei Krikalov, the first cosmonaut launched on a U.S. rocket. It will open you a kind of relationship even few years before. It was very difficult to imagine. Imagine. Today, a new moon is in the sky. Nearly 40 years after Sputnik, the orbiting adversaries seem to need each other. The U.S. has the shuttle. The Russians have the space station Mir. Two former, formerly very strong rival nations uh, can, in fact, come together and achieve much, bo much more than either of the two of us could have done alone. The Russians know more about long flights. Krikalov has spent 15 months in orbit. Once he was stranded on Mir five months because the Russians couldn't pay for his return. Next year, an American will ride a Russian rocket for a three-month stay on Mir. Then the shuttle will fly to the Russian station. The goal is to build a next-generation station, build it faster for less money, and form a permanent partnership in orbit. Scott Pelley, CBS News, Houston. In the latest shuttle mission... Discovery is on an eight-day journey, carrying five astronauts and a cosmonaut. Jenny West has more on this historic mission. It was, for all intents and purposes, a perfect launch. The countdown clock ticked away, and at 7.10 a.m. Eastern Time on the dot, the space shuttle Discovery blasted off on a column of fire. Three, two, one... Booster ignition and liftoff of the NASA officials are beyond delighted about today's picture-perfect liftoff. It was a tremendous effort, once again, by a tremendous group of people here that are in the business of launching space shuttles, and it, it went beautifully. We had an on-time launch. All the systems were working. I guess it just doesn't get any better than this. This is the first of eight shuttle flights NASA has scheduled for 1994. And there's a passenger of particular note on board who's ushering in what space agency officials call the start of a new era in human spaceflight. 35-year-old Sergei Krikalov is the first Russian in history to participate in an American space mission from start to finish. 
On day three of the eight-day mission, the Discovery crew will deploy and later retrieve the so-called Wake Shield facility, used to grow super-thin films used in advanced electronics. And there's a battery of experiments lined up on SpaceHab. The first commercially developed laboratory module is making its second shuttle venture. Sergei Krikalov is not just along for the ride. He will be assisting the space hat experiments, and it will be his job to retrieve the weight shield facility on the fifth day of Discovery's mission. Jenny West, CNN, the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Well, he called off today's release after astronauts aboard Space Shuttle Discovery struggled with electrical problems on the so-called weight shield facility. John Holloman has more. A lot of long faces at Mission Control in Houston. The major task for the Discovery crew could not be done. The Wake Shield orbiting factory was supposed to be 40 miles behind Discovery Saturday, producing wafers of high-tech material for computer chips in this chamber. But it's back in the shuttle's cargo bay. The first problem occurred shortly after the satellite was grabbed by the shuttle robot arm. These five lights were supposed to be on. They indicate whether the data systems and main power systems for the satellite are working, and they were not. The problem was traced to one of three batteries aboard, and it was solved by wiring around the bad battery. The satellite was moved outside the cargo bay for release, but then the two radio transmitters on board failed. Managers think Discovery's satellite TV antenna used to send pictures from space might be interfering with the transmitters aboard Wake Shield. The crew will try again Sunday to send the shuttle's major payload into space, but to do that, they'll have to delay or cancel many of their biomedical experiments. Even with their problems, the astronauts had a chance to send remarkable pictures back to Earth. In the Space Hab laboratory, this crystal of a medical product was growing inside the red liquid. And out the window, the astronauts took this picture of an aurora in the atmosphere as Discovery passed over Australia. John Holloman, CNN reporting. Uh, that would wake you up with a smile this morning. That was, in fact, your sim team singing to you. Uh, harboring uh, long-held uh, biases and, and prejudices, uh, things can be much better. So I am uh, very, very encouraged by the experience that, that my crew and I have had over this last year, and uh, I think it bodes well for the world. And uh, cosmonaut Afanasyev, let me ask you the same question. И вас, вас об этом. Об этом же. Что вы думаете что по вы поводу думаете, сотрудничества? По поводу сотрудничества? Мы уйдем немного в историю, то мы... If we go back into history, we would recall that we began cooperating in 1973 when uh, the Soyuz Apollo agreement was signed, and that set it on practical track. The docking in outer space, for that age, that was a great achievement for our two countries, and I am confident that future cooperation between our two countries in outer space exploration will continue. And I am sure that it will be to the benefit of the United States and the Russian Federation. To the Mir space station, it's Michael Gillen again. I'm Michael, wondering Michael if this cooperation will ultimately lead to a trip to Mars with the two countries together. There has been a lot of speculation about that. I'm confident that a Mars mission is not a mission for one country, but a mission for a number of countries. We have to rely on the experience of a whole number of countries. It's very hard for one country to accomplish, and very expensive, too. Well, we're about to lose our satellite hookup because of the positions of the space stations in the world. I want to thank all six of you. This has really been uh, extraordinary. As I say, it is something of a stunt because uh, uh, the hookup, we can now do it, and it's a great fun to do, but it's really not a stunt because uh, the cooperative age in space is progressing. There will be uh, docking missions between U.S. shuttles and, uh, and the Soviet space station. We're going to have a, an American astronaut in, uh, up on the Mir. 
and eventually a joint space station. So I thank you all for joining us for a first step here. And I would mention to the audience that in the 15 minutes we've been talking, each of those uh, spacecraft traveled about 4,000 miles across the Earth just in the few moments that we've been speaking. We're going to take a commercial break. Again, our thanks, and our thanks also to our translator, Sergei Mikheyev. I hope I pronounced his name correctly. We'll be back with a news break in Morton Dean. Stay with us. Brown and cosmonauts aboard Russia's space station. More on that from John Holloman. Discovery Houston, no need to respond. We see you inside the crew cabin. The astronauts gave their first of several TV interviews. And Jan Davis, who operates the shuttle's robot arm and has been moving that wake shield satellite outside the cargo bay, says even though the satellite couldn't be launched, the mission is not a failure. Well, the original plan for the wake shield was to leave it attached to the arm and grow the crystals while it was on the arm. And so uh, it was a later idea to deploy a free flyer. So they're actually getting very good science with it attached to the arm. Uh, the quality of the crystals may not be quite as good since we are close to the shuttle environment, which is a little bit uh, more contaminated than, of course, out in free space. But they were able to grow some crystals, and uh, we'll wait and see what they're like. But uh, we were able to get some good science. The shuttle crew also contacted the Mir space station. The communications link-up involved technicians in Russia as well as the United States, but a total of three Mir crew members and three Discovery crew members were able to chat. One more thing to talk about on the U.S. space front. The Air Force launched its first Milstar satellite late yesterday. The Milstar is designed to provide secure communications from space in the event of a nuclear war. The launch, delayed for months by technical problems, went well late yesterday, and we'll know in a few weeks if the Milstar is working. John Holloman, CNN reporting. Kennedy Space Center, so the space shuttle's crew is going to wait an extra 90-minute orbit at least and perhaps try again around 2.15 Eastern time. That would slightly alter Discovery's landing path. Discovery also could land at the California's Edwards Air Force Base, more likely might remain in space yet another day in hopes of better weather tomorrow. Seen as John Holloman is following this homecoming, and he'll join us later in News Hour with more detail. Weather's been good, bad, good, bad all day. I mean, our Charles Jacobs down there. We'll talk to him on the phone in just a second. But uh, the Discovery astronauts aren't going to come home uh, today after all, apparently. They were scheduled to be landing at about this time at the Kennedy Space Center, but a combination of a storm front moving toward the Space Center from the west combined with increasing winds at the shuttle landing strip forced NASA to postpone the first landing opportunity. Here's a picture taken from a camera on top of the huge vehicle assembly building at the Kennedy Space Center. The camera is looking toward the southwest, which is the direction the shuttle would be coming in. CNN's Charles Jaco is at the Kennedy Space Center right now. Charles, what does it look like as you look toward the shuttle landing strip? Uh, John, the clouds have, uh, are starting to break up. In fact, uh, the folks here are now saying that the weather is looking better, but as you said, it's been good, bad, good, bad uh, all morning long. Uh, the winds have apparently shifted into a direction that would be uh, better for the shuttle landing, and if they want to try it here, uh, the shuttle would land at approximately 2.21 p.m. Eastern time or in about an hour and a half from now. Um, they're still trying to do that. Uh, the, the only scheduled landing after that would be at Edwards Air Force Base in California, but as we've heard all morning, uh, there are in very high winds at Edwards, and they don't look like they could do it there. So they're being more hopeful here. A decision will be made within the next uh, 15 minutes or so, or 20 minutes, we imagine, about whether or not to try landing it here, or indeed whether or not to try to put it off until tomorrow, which according to these preliminary worksheets we have from NASA, there are uh, four landing opportunities, two at uh, Kennedy Space Center and two at Edwards. Oh, well, you know, you've been there for lots of launches and landings. What does your experience tell you about a possible landing later today? Is it, is it uh, possible that the weather could get good enough soon enough for this to happen? Uh, I have no idea. I'm not qualified to take either Flip Spiceland or Valerie Voss's job at this point. <laughs> um, I just know that uh, taking a look um, around here, the clouds will thicken up and then break up. But what you saw from that tower cam picture was essentially the leading edge of a front, uh, the strongest part of which is over by Tampa Bay right now. And uh, there is about a 40% chance of rain associated with that and some fairly high winds. In fact, a few tornadoes pushing in front of that front. 
So uh, it would be a race against time, but again, the NASA folks here say that that front seems to have slowed down a little bit, so they might very well be able to do it, uh, but we're just going to have to wait and see. Okay, NASA commentator Kyle Herring said a few minutes ago that all preparations are complete for a rocket firing to bring the shuttle down if the weather improves. It would occur, um, as you say, for the 2.19 p.m. Eastern Time landing in Florida, but from, um, from what we are hearing, it's just not something that you can count on at this point. This uh, last landing attempt today would be at Edwards Air Force Base in California, but there are high winds there, and those high winds are creating a problem for that landing opportunity as well. So, Bobby, it's, uh, it's sort of still up in the air. The astronauts are in their spacesuits. They've got the cargo bay doors closed. They're, they're ready to come home. And yeah. uh, if, they don't, if we don't hear some news that's uh, favorable and encouraging within the next 30 minutes, it'll probably be waved off until tomorrow. Well, as always, better safe than sorry. Exactly. All right, John, thanks. Me? They're about ready to receive the shuttle Discovery, and CNN's John Holloman is here. He's been covering the mission, and it's about to come on in. It sure is, Natalie. This is a live picture we can show you now from NASA at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This is a camera on top of the vehicle assembly building. Look uh, up in the sky now. You'll be able, through the clouds, to see the shuttle Discovery as it makes its final approach. It's traveling about uh, between 350 and 400 miles an hour right now. It's been slowing down steadily for the past couple of minutes flying over the Kennedy Space Center in anticipation of its now. touchdown in less than 60 seconds from right now. Uh, it's a fairly hazy day there, and so the shuttle will probably pop into view on your screen in just a couple of minutes. The shuttle's been in space for eight days, and the crew is experiencing the Earth's gravity for the first time in more than a week. The mission has been only partially successful, as you know. One of the, uh, uh, the major payloads aboard the Wake Shield satellite uh, was not able to perform as NASA had hoped uh, for it to perform. It was supposed to fly away from Discovery and manufacture pure wafers of gallium arsenide. Isn't that a pretty spaceship? <laughs> we'll, we'll listen to the last few seconds of uh, Discovery's flight as it comes on in for a landing anticipated uh, in the next 15 or 20 seconds. Main gear touchdown. Drag sheets deployed. That was gear touchdown. All right, uh, you can see it there live on your screen. The shuttle Discovery now uh, with the drag chute uh, slowing its speed to a halt. CNN's Charles Jaco is out there at the landing strip. Charles, what does it sound like out there as the shuttle touches down? Well, John, it's amazingly silent except for the uh, helicopters you might be able to hear overhead and the chase planes that are those famous twin sonic booms that occur about two to three minutes before touchdown. This time, they were relatively silent because normally what happens is the shuttle will pass directly over the landing strip and make essentially a 180-degree turn, so the sonic boom shake the windows here. This time, it followed a landing pattern that a shuttle has never followed before. It came in a good deal to the uh, north of here, so the booms were rather muted, but otherwise, there's almost this eerie, complete silence as this great white space plane, approximately the size of a DC-9 jetliner, touches down and then uh, glides down the end of the runway. The only sound, really, were people uh, kind of gasping their breath and then breaking out in applause. It's an awesome sight. You know, the word awesome is overused, I think. Uh, I was out at the, the landing strip last week, as, as you are there today, and it's just awesome to think of what happens there uh, when this spaceship comes in. Well, indeed, they uh, right now they're moving uh, a lot of the equipment out to safe the vehicle. Emergency equipment, of course, has been standing by here. One thing a lot of people might not be able to tell from the picture on their TV screens is the shuttle looks so pristine and gleaming white when it comes in, but when you see it up close, it actually looks a little dinged up and a little dirty, which I imagine all of us would be after uh, eight days in space and a launch and a landing, but there are dark streaks across it, and... Uh, 
you know, smudges and uh, a heat burn from the re-entry and all sorts of things. But to the people here, it's still a glorious sight, especially since uh, the talk here today has not been so much of this mission, but of the fact that it looks like out of the 2,400 member workforce here, uh, three, four, maybe 500 people could be laid off in the latest round of federal government uh, budget cuts. So uh, this certainly heartens the people here, especially those of them uh, who may be losing their jobs. Exactly, Charles. Well, listen, thank you for uh, bringing us up to speed with the atmosphere there at the end of the landing strip. It's, uh, it's quite a sight. The shuttle will be there at the end of the runway for, uh, for some time. Uh, there's, there's a process that uh, engineers on the ground go through to make sure there are no poison gases still left in any of the compartments aboard. And it'll be a while before the crew comes out. Um, we'll be watching back at my desk in the back, and when we see the crew people come out, I'll show you some pictures of that. Okay. Nice to have them home. Thanks, yeah. John. And we'll continue in just a moment.